Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, today we are going to be discussing the very important topic of uh, regularization in machine learning. <clears throat> so um, all of us know that in machine learning, what we have to do is that uh, we have to make the bias and variance trade off. So, um, so a high bias means that the model is underfitting and the high variance means that the model is uh, overfitting in fact okay so we have to maintain a balance uh, between these two and all of us realize that so regularization is an activity which uh, helps us to avoid overfitting specifically the high variance situation uh, and it also helps us to increase the interpretability of the model uh, what that means is that the uh, model becomes uh, more simple to understand and manage or use for that matter. So basically, uh, when we talk about regularization, so regularization can mean uh, any activity uh, which helps you avoid overfitting. But uh, we do we do associate this with uh, a form of a regression mostly uh, in which what we do is that we constrain or regularize or in other words shrink the coefficient estimates towards zero uh, what that means is that you know okay, this is the normal case of regression in which uh, y is the uh, dependent variable and x1 x2 and xp are p independent variables so what in regression, what we're doing is that we are learning these coefficients, beta one, beta two, uh, one coefficient for each of the independent variable, along with obviously uh, the intercept, you can say, uh, or the y-intercept as we normally call it. So it's more of a constant that we have to learn. So in, in the case of the simple line, so we have y equals to uh, mx plus c. So we have simply one independent variable, this is uh, like beta one, for example, and this is uh, beta zero. So we can uh, map this equation to higher dimensions uh, in this way. Okay. So what regularization does is that we, you know, we put a bound or a constraint on the values of these beta coefficients, uh, specifically on the values of beta one to beta p not beta zero. So what we do is we want, we, we say we want to regularize or shrink them, okay? So we, we know that the line fitting, uh, the line that we want to fit in, a, in the case of a regression is dependent obviously on the value of this beta one or in this case, beta two and beta p, all of them. So if we are able to constrain the values of these beta parameters, then obviously we can control the regression in a very good way. So it's like, you know, we are forcing, uh, we are forcing some values on these beta parameters besides the values which have been estimated through regression. So for example, uh, you can say is that I have learned the equation of this line y equals to two x plus three. So this is the regression that I've done. But then I do regularization and it turns out that I am doing y equals to 1.5x plus three. So what I did was that I, I shrank the value of this beta one parameter to 1.5. And why did I do that? Because I wanted to just avoid overfitting. So I'm doing something extra besides the regression, okay? So it's, it's, more, uh, it's more interpretable here when we have the residual sum of squares so we have this equation of the line. The residual sum of squares is calculated like uh, from the true value, uh, the actual value. We subtract obviously uh, the predicted value. So this we think subtract from here. Um, and we take the sum of the squares over all the data points. And that gives me the residual sum of squares. So that's the normal case that we, we have, you know. This is the normal value that we want to minimize in the case of regression. So the, the, the formula for regression, basically the method of regression minimizes the residual sum of squares. 
But what we, what we do in regularization is that we typically add something here along with the RSS so that we have more control over these beta parameters. That's what we do, okay? So I will repeat that. Besides the regular residual sum of squares equation in which we you know, extract, we subtract the, um, this fitted model from the true value, uh, the predicted minus the actual, and take the square and sum over all the data points in the training data, for example, and then we just uh, you know calculate then we try to minimize RSS. So in regularization, what we do, what we do is that we add an add an term here. Okay, besides the RSS, why do we add that? Because we want to do this. We want to shrink. We have we want more control over the values of the beta parameters. Okay. So what what's what's that going to achieve? So that is going to basically uh, you can say that discourage learning a more complex or flexible model. So if we, if we don't constrain these values of the beta parameters, then what's gonna happen is that we, the model could get out of hand and you know, it could overfit uh, in the case of noise. So if, if we have noise in the data, then the model will overfit and uh, you know, it's gonna have a very high variance. So if we have different types of, uh, different subsets of the test data coming in, so the model is going to demonstrate a very high variance in the performance because the model has overfitted. But if I constrain the values of the beta parameters, then it's, uh, it's a guarantee within a particular confidence interval that uh, I will discourage learning a more complex or a flexible model. And that is going to avoid the risk of overfitting. So it, it's it's a it seems a naive approach to do it that that I I'm constraining these parameters but really uh, we can't think of a better way of uh, doing regularization rather than putting a constraint by adding something here okay so I hope that this uh, is concept is clear to everybody so uh, yeah so we have the regular we have the regular RSS it's, uh, I've written it here. And uh, the, this in the situation in which we have noise in the training data. Now, um, noise just not, the noise just does not always mean an error. Uh, noise means the diversity in the behavior of whoever is generating the data, you know, it could be some you know, someday you might be behaving quite erratically because something has gone wrong somewhere else. So you generate a very uh, strange type of pattern. You know, you generate an anomaly, and uh, you know that that is noise because you don't follow the normal the normal distribution of the data. Uh, but it, we are not if we if we don't do some stats before that, which we don't typically do. We just see the box plots and all those things. And we might not be able to detect the noise through the box plots or the histogram even. Um, then in that case, the estimated coefficients will not generalize to the future data. Uh, and then obviously the model will overfit and this is the case of high variance. So the variance is pretty high. Um, so in that case, what we do is that we shrink or regularize the coefficients towards zero. That's the main thing. So we want to make the impact of these variables, beta one to beta p, as less as possible, uh, because we want to control them. Right? We want to control the way regression is being done. And the only way to do that is to force these variables to go towards zero. And uh, you know, ideally, one of the best things could be that I want some of these coefficients to become zero. For example, if I have something like that, y equals to three uh, plus three uh, x one plus two x two plus blah, 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 uh, nine x three. Right, so, uh, so if we have an equation like that, so, uh, so Let's say this is like nine uh, x uh, eight, for example. So we have eight um, independent variables. So uh, the the more variable, the more variables I have, you know, the more chances of overfitting I have. So 
what I what I want ideally is that I I don't want to have like eight independent variables. Uh, what I would want ideally to have is that I just want to have a few independent variables. For example, I just want x1, x2, and maybe x3. But you know, handling eight independent variables, which could be the normal case in regression, is um, is something which is going to give me more chance of overfitting and less control. So in in this case, I have to control eight beta parameters, but in this case, I have to control only three. So I want regularization to help me in that as well. That, for example, let's call it feature selection. Okay, so. Uh, that is also something that regularization gives us. But basically what we want is that we want to control these parameters to a large degree. And we want to force them towards zero. We want to make some of them zero, in fact, that like I told you here, that I don't want so many independent variables. But that's another thing. Basically what I want is that I want to control each and every beta coefficient so that it tends towards zero. Uh, so in, 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 in other words, so if these coefficients are noisy, so if these eight coefficients are noisy, so I want to control them and put them towards zero so that the effect of the noise is basically diminished and uh, hence I can avoid overfitting, okay? So I hope that this concept is clear. Uh, so what, what we do is that, like I told you in the last slide, what we do is that we basically add uh, a term here uh, which in this case we call a shrinkage quantity. Yeah, so it's, it's called a shrinkage quantity because this is going to help me move all my coefficients towards zero. That's why it's called a shrinkage quantity. So this is going to help me move all my, uh, uh, these coefficients towards zero. So how that happens, we'll, see, we'll have to see that. Uh, so the main, the main thing that this equation is telling us is that we have the original residual sum of squares and we are adding a regularization term, which is called a shrinkage quantity because it gives me a quantity that how much I want the data to shrink. So I told you here that what we want is that we want to pull the coefficients towards zero so that the effect of noise basically diminishes. But uh, I want to understand that how much should I shrink it, how much, okay? So in that case, um, I have to include this term, which is called lambda. And some people also call it alpha. Okay, so you, you see what we're doing here is that we are adding the parameters. We are adding all the parameters and we are multiplying that by a factor which is called lambda. So now it becomes clear that, it, you know, by using a value of lambda, I have control over the beta parameters so I can shrink them towards zero through the lambda parameter. Okay, so that's that's what that's what I'm doing. So if, for example, uh, we can have a high value of lambda or a low value of lambda, okay, so we can see how we will see how that influences the model. But it basically tells us how much we want to penalize the flexibility of our model. Okay, so uh, I want to make my model flexible. Uh, so how how I'm, how which which variable is going to give me control over that flexibility is what is defined by the lambda parameter so in in ridge regression what we are doing is that ridge regression is the first type of regularization uh, in this what we are doing is that the term that we have added we square uh, we find the sum of squares of the coefficients and multiply that by the lambda so if the lambda value is high, then you know uh, this this term is we, we we make a large addition to the residual sum of squares, and if the lambda value is zero, then it's basically the original OLS model based on the residual sum of squares. So we have to we have to we have to spend some time uh, we have to spend some effort in determining the ideal value of lambda, which is going to give me the bias variance trade off. Okay, so I'll just write that down here. Uh, we have to make an effort to find out the ideal value of lambda or alpha, 
which is going to help me attain the bias variance trade off that's the main thing that that we want okay so we have to make a, we have to make an effort uh, that what is the added value of lambda the the lambda the lambda does not vary only between 0 and 1 because this is what we have seen in most cases that um, if we have a learning parameter like in neural networks so we vary the value between 0 and 1 typically but that is not the case in lambda lambda is never 0 otherwise there is no use of doing it okay so it could it could start from let's say 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 or something like that and go up to 2 or 3 or 4 so we we have to find out the ideal value so this is this is the game that we have to play so i hope that this is clear so the the flexibility that we want to achieve is basically defined by the value of lambda so how much my model is flexible or uh, or or you know uh, i have control over the model flexibility basically basically means the control so de that depends basically on the value of lambda So how much we want to penalize the flexibility of our model? That is basically lambda. So what, what is happening here is that this is a, a penalizing term. Okay, so we are basically doing, we are saying that, okay, you have done a good job, residual sum of squares, you have done a pretty good job, but uh, you know we want to come in and force some things on you because we want to punish you for learning the noise in the data and overfitting so in order to punish you we are introducing this term so it's sort of a penalty for you and you are you are making your model pretty flexible here by learning the noise and overfitting so we want to reduce that flexibility by adding this term okay so in ridge regression what we add is the square of the coefficients and multiply that by lambda uh, and that is obviously the shrinkage quantity in ridge regression uh, and the increase in the flexibility of the model is represented by an increase in its coefficients. Okay, so the uh, the more the more coefficients we have, the more flexible the model becomes. The more there's a chance that the the, the model will overfit if there are more and more coefficients. Okay, so we can we can have as many coefficients as we want because that's the decision of the data analyst. But this is the main thing that is going to put the control there, the, the penalty for having so many variables. So for all the variables, we are imposing this penalty because we are doing the sum of squares. So this lambda penalty in, in, one, in a sense is applied over all the coefficients. Okay. Uh, so if, if we want to minimize this function, this pen, penalized regularization function, then these coefficients need to be small. Okay, that's what we are, because that is the only way to control them, right? We, we make them smaller so that their effect is not that much significant, okay? So we want to prevent the coefficients from rising too high because if, if, if I have many coefficients and all of them are, you know, uh, a high valued coefficient, then my model becomes really flexible and it starts to, uh, learn noisy parameters and it gets out of control, right? There's sort of a situation in which you, you know, uh, you have an animal and you de-rope it and it starts to run away. But if you put a rope around its neck, you can control it. So it's uh, it's completely that uh, analogy. So by 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 actually uh, in, introducing these terms, we are penalizing the flexibility of having too many parameters and learning large, large values of the parameters. So the, on, the only way to restrict, uh, the only way to restrict the overfitting or the learning of the noise is to force the parameters to go towards zero. Uh, or in other words, basically, it's not, it's not only about going towards zero. Basically, this is what we are doing. We don't want the values of the coefficients to rise too high. That is what we want to do. So that the only way to do that is to force them towards zero. That's the only way to do that. So basically, this is what we want to do. Okay, and uh, we 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 do this by forcing the coefficients towards zero because there is no other way to do that. 
by preventing coefficients from rising to it. The only, the only logical way to do that is to force them towards, you know, something insignificant, which is zero. So what we do is that we, the sh we shrink the association of each independent variable with the dependent variable. But we don't do that for beta zero. Like I told you before, if we have y equals to 2x plus 3, so 2x1 plus 3x2 plus 4. So in this case, beta zero is 4. OK. Uh, so we, 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 don't, we don't want to shrink that because in, this, in the situation uh, in which uh, all of these are zero, x1, x2 are zero, so y must take on some value. So it's, 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 it can be in that situation can be taken as the mean value of the response. So, or, or the y variables so in case all the independent variables have a value of zero. So everything, this, this, all of this, uh, so all of this becomes zero. Okay. Uh, so in that case, the response variable will be a measure of this beta zero. It's, it's, it's like a mean value. So we, uh, we, we therefore shy away from minimizing this because this is not actually related to any independent variable. So we don't mess with that. So our only, uh, our only concern is basically uh, to minimize the coefficients, which are the coefficients of the independent variable. So I hope that this is clear. So we, uh, we, we, we do not, uh, penalize the beta zero term in, in any way. Okay, so that's just a y intercept or the intercept term. Uh, and that represents the average value of the response variable in case everything goes to zero. So we don't need to penalize that. So I, I hope that this is clear up to now. So um, when lambda equals to zero, so in this case, obviously, ridge regression is equal to the least squares because this becomes zero. So that's pretty obvious. But uh, as we increase the value of lambda to towards infinity, uh, infinity does not mean like, for example, 1,000 or 5,000, something like that. Um, due to the nature of this shrinkage uh, function, the, when, when I increase the value of lambda, this impact of this uh, penalty grows. Uh, and uh, this, What's, what it is going to do is that it is that is going to basically shrink the coefficient estimates towards zero. So increasing the value of lambda is going to automatically uh, shrink or regularize the values of these coefficients towards zero. Um, so we, we we do not know the value of lambda. For example, in uh, multiple uh, in uh, multi-layer perceptron, if we have the learning rate. So initially the learning rate is pretty high, like for example, 0 0.7 or something like that, or 0 0.8 for that matter. And as we go through the different epochs, uh, we exponentially uh, shrink the learning rate because we don't need to learn at high pace all the time. So there it's pretty easy to control, but I really do not know uh, how this Lambda is going to impact uh, the total sum of squares the residual sum of squares that I have or the, or, the, or the loss function, the total loss function that I want to minimize, I do not have a very high control over that. So I have to find out the value of lambda through cross-validation. All, all of us know what cross-validation is. So I have to find out the value of lambda through cross-validation operator. Um, and, and that is something which we need to do because we, we, are, we do not know how the value is going to, we, we know that as I increase lambda, uh, the, these parameters are going to shrink towards zero, but then what is the ideal value of lambda? Is it one, is it two, is it 2.5, is it 1.98? I do not know. So I try out different values uh, of lambda through, through cross-validation and the cross-validation helps me achieve that. So if I, if I couple this up with cross-validation, so it does help me achieve the, uh, the ideal value of uh, lambda in this case. So in, in other words, for each value of lambda that I try, I do a tenfold cross validation for them. Okay, so for each value of lambda, I, I try in my code, I do a tenfold cross validation. And then I see the scores, cross validation score for every value of lambda. Um, and then I, I see, uh, I pick the lambda which gives me the highest cross validation score because we have a function 
uh, in Python in scikit-learn, which gives me a cross-validation score. So I, I pick the lambda, which gives me the highest value of the score. Uh, so uh, this term, uh, in statistics, we call this term as the L2 norm. So the ridge regression is typically also called as L2 in that respect. So this is the L2 norm. This, this statistically, this is called the L2 norm. Uh, so now it is clear to us that what we are aiming at. So we are we want to find out the ideal values of these parameters uh, so that um, I avoid the overfitting. So I have to do something besides the residual sum of squares why so I, I penalize the parameters with respect to this term in which I find the sum of squares of the parameters and regularize that with respect to lambda. I do not know the ideal value of lambda, which I have. So I, I try out different values of lambda and for each value, um, I basically do a cross validation uh, over the data provided to me. And that basically helps me to zone home in on the ideal value of lambda. So we're gonna see that in the code later on. So I hope that this concept is now clear as far as this regression is concerned. Um, there is another difficult concept that goes with this uh, rich regression regularization. Um, the you know when I have the standard uh, regression equation like this, so the coefficients that I produce here uh, are basically a scale equivariant. So what does that mean? That, that means that, um, so let me just write that down. Uh, so scale equivariance means that if I transform X as per my requirement, for example, I X are weights in kilograms, which I convert to tons. Okay. So in the, in this case, um, means that I transform X as per my requirement by obviously because x is a vector so i have to multiply that by a matrix if i want to transform that in this case for example i want to convert the weights in kilograms to weights in tons so i have to multiply this x by a matrix so by multiplying by a matrix okay so i, I transform that so if i if i transform x if i transform x by any quantity, let's say C, then the coefficient of that X is going to be automatically multiplied by a quantity one over C. Now, this is written in one of the famous books on statistical machine learning, and that is uh, what I have written here as well. Uh, if we multiply each input variable by C, then the corresponding coefficients are scaled by a factor of one by C. That is, that is called scale equivariance. You know, to understand that simply, let's say I have this equation, which is the simple uh, linear regression equation. I want to transform X, okay? So I, I multiply X by S, where S is a diagonal matrix containing the transformation that I want. I told you here that I have to multiply that by the matrix. But in order to keep the sanctity of this equation in place, I, I have to multiply beta by S minus one because S into S minus one is going to give me the identity matrix. And that is going to give me the same equation as this one. So if I if I'm multiplying X by S, then in order to maintain the sanctity of this equation, I have to multiply the beta parameters by S minus one, which is equivalent to like one over C. So this is the most simplest explanation you can find on the internet for this particular explanation. Okay, so that is the that happens in case when I have the regular RSS formula 
for uh, regression. So in that case, if I am multiplying X by a transformation matrix, then I have to multiply the coefficient of that by the inverse of that transformation matrix. And that basically leads me to this conclusion. Okay, so in this case, it, it does not matter how we scale the predictor. It does not matter how we scale the predictor. The multiplication of predictor and coefficient remains the same because we have to multiply the coefficient by S minus one in order to maintain the sanctity of this equation. Because S into S minus one gives me the identity matrix, which means basically uh, one. Okay, So that gives me same equation Y equals to X beta plus E, or I can write it like that. So there's, there's no way I can multiply that by this and not do this because then I disturb the regression equation. So that's a simple explanation that what, that's what happens in normal regression case. Okay? But the, the point is that if I add this term, if I add this term, like I've added this term here, then this thing is not easy. You know, I cannot apply the same concept here because now that the, the loss function has changed. So what I need to do is that I need to basically scale them with respect to this penalizing term. So if I am adding the penalty term here, then I have to scale these independent variables in a separate way before I can start minimizing the loss function. That's how it is. If I, if I don't have regularization, then this thing is pretty cool to understand everything is fine, okay? I can do whatever I want. But if I am regularizing, then I definitely must scale this uh, input variables to make the whole equation scale equivalent. If I don't do that, then it's not going to work, okay? So this thing is explained pretty here, pretty clearly here. Okay, this is not true in rigid regression, so we need to standardize uh, the predictors to the same scale before rigid regression. So in this case, x, i, j, each independent variable, we have to scale according to this equation. So we convert them before we actually do the rigid regression. That is before we actually start minimizing this loss function, this whole loss function. I can't, I can't minimize that until I scale these variables first. So to scale that, what we do is that for each independent variable, we have the mean behavior and we have the behavior over all the values in the tra training data. So for each independent variable, we just sum up uh, the deviation you can say from the mean for of that variable over all the data points in the training set. Use this as the scaling factor, and you know this is the divisor or dividend. This is the divisor. So uh, th this this is the new value. This is the scaled value of x i j uh, with respect to you know uh, the uh, this uh, scaling factor. So I hope that this concept is clear. You just need to clear the concept. Okay, that's what you need to do. Okay. You need to understand that why this is happening because in the original case, if I if I do a scale invariance, it is pretty simple. Okay, I can just multiply s, and so, so I have to multiply the predictor by s minus one. If I want the same thing in the case of ridge regression, or for that matter, lasso, then I have must definitely scale uh, each independent variable before I do the ridge regression uh, minimization. Okay. So you, you need to be just clear on this concept. You don't even need to remember what's happening here. This is a normal scaling term. So uh, I, I'm just calculating, you can say the, the deviation of each point from the mean and summing it up, it's like uh, the more or less like standard deviation, okay? So just dividing that by the by x, i, j. So that's that's what we, we, we are just standardizing that. Okay. So I hope that uh, this concept is clear. So that was basically rich regression. And uh, now we go to the other regularization technique, which is called lasso. Uh, and lasso is uh, primarily um, the name of the regularization, this regularization quantity. And you can see what's different here from the rich case is that we are just uh, summing up over the modulus uh, of uh, the coefficients, not the square, but the modulus. And this is called the L1 norm in statistics. So therefore, lasso is also called this the L1 regularization. Okay, so you just need to understand this. Uh, remember that lasso is primarily L1 and ridge is L2 norm basically. So these are the norm. So these are the vector norms 
the, the standard definition of the norms L1, L2. So that's why we, we call them L1 and L2 regularization. So L1 is basically lasso. So we basically penalize the, uh, not the square of the coefficients, but the modulus. So this is the modulus penalty. Um, so you, you can see what's happening here. In the rich case, we are solving an equation where the summation of squares of the coefficients is less than or equal to quantity, which is S. Okay, so S is, is a constant that exists for each value of shrinkage factor lambda. So what, does, what that means is that I'm trying out different values of lambda and this value of lambda is helping me to keep the loss within a range S, within a value S. So by trying out different values of lambda, I can say that my loss is, is less than a particular value of S. Okay, so S is just a generic concept. Uh, you can say that lambda ki different values may try around or different values could try karne ki wajah se jo mera total loss hai wo S se kam reh rahe. Okay, so in English, so I'm trying out different values of lambda and by trying out the different values of lambda, my total loss is uh, basically, so uh, what we're discussing is that uh, the, the constant, So the constant S here is, is a bound basically that what we're saying is that this thing whole is going to give me a constant S. Uh, so for, for each value of lambda, I have a value of constant S and S is the bound overall bound over all of these parameters. You can see the overall bound. So uh, if I'm doing ridge regression, then I'm solving an equation in which the total sum of squares of the coefficients is less than or equal to S, depending on the value of lambda. So you can say that this whole term equates to S. <coughs> and in the case of lasso regression, we, 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 we know that we are solving an equation in which the sum of the modulus of the coefficients is basically less than or equal to S. I'm seeing less than or equal to S because uh, we are trying to minimize the values of the coefficients towards, we are trying to pull them towards zero in fact, okay? So that is why I'm using the term less than or equal to S. So I want to constrain basically. So I'll just write that down. Less than or equal to S means that uh, the value S is a constraint of the regularization term. So this uh, means that this whole regularization quantity, this 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 thing that we have drawn here, that oh, sorry about that. So this basically sums up to S. Okay. So we want to we want to make sure that by using different values of lambda, uh, so my whole uh, you know the 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 penalization or, or the or the values of the coefficients, either the sum of squares of the coefficients or the modulus of the, of the coefficients, remains within a bound S. Okay, so it's a constant. So I want to make sure that the total loss uh, remains within S. Okay, so I'm taking a bound on the whole equation. So this, this basically uh, ensures that, you know, uh, things remain within S. So just, just get the concept in your head. It's not very difficult to understand. So in, in the case of ridge regression, the sum of squares of the coefficients will be bounded within S. And in the case of lasso regression, the, the sum of modulus of the coefficients will be bounded within S. So you can say that the S is a circle and the sum of squares or the sum of modulus is lying within this circle, okay? So I'm just making a bound on that. 
So uh, what what that means is that uh, if we if if we assume that I have two independent variables, then for the case of ridge regression, I have beta one square plus beta two square is less than or equal to s. Okay. So what does this, what the, what that means is that the coefficients uh, have the smallest values of the loss function for all points that lie within the circle given by this. So this is the equation of a circle: uh, x square x1 square plus x2 square is less than or equal to 3. That basically always is going to give me a circle. So x, uh, x, x, x1 square plus x2 square less than or equal to c is, is an equation of a circle. So these are squared because you're talking about ridge regression. So that's what I'm doing in ridge regression. I'm summing up the squares of the coefficients. So what I'm saying in the case of ridge regression is that the sum of the coefficients, the sum of squares of the coefficients that two coefficients I have basically is going to be bounded by S. So that's the B1 square plus B2 square is always going to lie within this S circle. Okay, so I am making a bound on the loss function. Okay, the, the smallest loss function that I'm going to have is going to, is going to be the one that is going to lie within this circle. And in the case of lasso, because I'm summing up the modulus, so that is basically going to give me a diamond. This is the equation of a diamond, basically. Okay, so so it's the the the, the sum of the modulus uh, of these two coefficients is going to lie within this diamond, and this diamond boundary is 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 being defined by S. So I hope that this is clear. That what we are saying basically is that if the value of beta one and beta two are lying within S circle or the S diamond, then it is okay, and you are doing the regularization. But if the values of these beta parameters are going outside this circle or this diamond, then it's not regularization. So we need to penalize so that they come within this diamond or this circle. Whatever uh, regression you choose, it's up to you. Okay. So we can uh, we can see this uh, in in the case of you know uh, uh, we can see this uh, in a, in a diagram. So this is the case of uh, lasso. Obviously, you can see that this is the diamond. Okay, and we want the values of beta one and beta two to lie within this, and that is going to give me the regularization. In the case of ridge, uh, I want the values of beta one and beta two to lie within this circle because we have beta one here, beta two here. So every coordinate uh, represents basically a particular value of these parameters. Okay, so these red circles or red ellipses are representing the regular. Uh, residual sum of squares. You can say these are not bounded. So I'll just write this down here. Uh, the red ellipses are not bounded. They are non-regularized. Which is the normal RSS case. The green uh, diamond slash circle are the regularized values of beta parameters or coefficients as we call them. Okay, so I hope that this uh, concept is now clear to you that uh, so we want to basically what we want to do is that we want to pull these these circles so uh, these circles are representing different selection regions for beta one and beta two so basically here i'm trying out different values of beta one and beta two but none of them is regularized so i want to pull pull these values within this diamond or pull these values within this circle that's what we want to do through by uh, through this addition of the term okay the shrinkage quantity so you can see that the green areas are the constraint functions that is uh, beta one square plus beta two square less than or equal to S and beta one modulus plus beta two modulus is less than or equal to S in both of these cases. So these are the constraint functions. Um, the contours represent the points on the ellipse uh, where we have the original RSS uh, formula. Uh, for a very large value of S, if, if I take a very large value of S, then these green circles are going to be like this. But that is not going to fulfill my purpose because that is not a bound that I want to make. I want to reduce the values of the parameters. 
so that you know um, i have more control over them and overfitting is avoided so if i have a very large value of values of s then this these these are going to be like that so the diamond is going to go like this but that is not going to fulfill my purpose because then that will be overfitting okay uh and that is going to bas basically be equal to the 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 regular rss case without the regularization term if i make very large values okay um but if i make a you know a regularized values then we want to constrain them within this region that's what we want to do um so in this case the if i if i constrain them then the uh, the the coefficient estimates are given by the first point at which an ellipse contacts the constraint region okay so in this case uh, what's happening here is that so uh, what's happening here is that if i constrain the values of beta 1 and beta 2 to lie within s then i have this boundary uh between the normal regression case which is the normal rss case and this this boundary can, i can i can make it the same so this is the regularized space so i can i can say that both of these are are div division so if i make a constraint that is uh, in other words if i take these two equations then in the case of these two equations then i have this boundary here okay so in this case uh, for for the case of the ridge regression the values of beta 1 and beta 2 are never going to be you know uh, so they are going to be non zero they can't be zero but in the case of lasso regression the values can be zero because if i take this point then this point represents a number in which i just have the value of beta 2 but the value of beta 1 is 0 in this case beta 2 is 0 again beta 1 is 0 again beta 2 is 0 so what you see is that due to the nature of the equation of the ridge regression i am ending up eliminating if i take this point this is an ideal point because i am within s i am not in the range of the normal regression or the the normal residual sum of squares non regularized so i am within s here and i am not using beta 1 here i am within s and i am not using beta 2 i am within s not using beta 2 within s not using beta 1 so therefore i am able to select the coefficients as well so i am reducing the number of coefficients or the number of independent variables and in that respect lasso regression is also a feature selection uh, mechanism so it's not feature selection like i am uh, finding out the importance of each feature or the worth of each feature through some statistical measure like like we do in random forest or mutual information etc etc but through the equation of the modulus uh, it helps me automatically reduce the number of coefficients and has the number of independent variables and in that respect it's basically doing what we call as the feature selection if we want to use that word we can use it it's not directly feature selection we are just eliminating the coefficients okay so in the case of ridge regression there are no elimination of coefficients but you can see that in the case of lasso regression i can eliminate the coefficients okay so since the ridge regression has a circular constraint with no sharp points this intersection of the region is not going to happen on any axis and therefore the Uh, the ridge regression coefficients are going to be exclusively non zero so that means that i'm going to use all of my independent variables all of my independent variables if i'm using ridge regression but in the case of the lasso regression i have written the same the ellipse will often intersect the constraint region at an axis so we are interested in this intersection of these two that's my point of interest in which i am i'm starting the regularization so so one of the coefficients will be zero as i have already told you and in this way you know i can eliminate the coefficients and hence i can eliminate the independent variables and that's why we also say that lasso regression is better than uh, ridge regression that the, the for example i am saying that um, the l1 is better than l2 uh, because of this particular feature it has okay so it it helps me reduce the number of parameters 
So here we can see that we have a disadvantage of ridge regression is that the, the number of parameters are not going to decrease. Uh, so it is going to shrink all the important parameters uh, to a value which is close to zero, but it is never going to make them exactly zero. So the final model is going to include all the predictors, uh, but in the case of uh, lasso regression, what's going to happen is that, you know, uh, the L1 penalty has the effect of forcing some of the coefficient estimates to be exactly zero. It depends on where I take the intersection region because the intersection region between the normal case and the regularized case is this point in which I'm starting that. So that's the boundary of my S. Um, so it is going to force some of the coefficient estimates to be exactly zero when the lambda is sufficiently large. So obviously, uh, I don't want lambda to be close to zero. So I'm going to try out values like one, two, three, or something like that. So that, that's what you mean by sufficient, sufficiently large. So therefore, the lasso method also performs variable selection and is set to yield sparse models. And that's a big deal, you know, because um, I am eliminating many variables from the model. Uh, and I'm in this way, I'm doing generalization better. I am reducing the variance while keeping the bias constant. So it is helping me achieve bias variance trade-off. It is helping me achieve uh, feature selection. And it is, it, is, it is more simpler model as compared to the ridge regression because it is not giving me a square, rather it is just, it's just taking the modulus. So the, the, the coefficient remains the same, but I'm just taking the modulus of that. I'm not doing a square over that. That makes things more complicated uh, numerically as well, uh, or computationally, you can say. So it has, obviously it has many benefits. Um, so any least squares met method will have variance in it. It's going to overfit. And in that case, obviously it is not going to generalize well. It's going to have a high variance and that is going to prevent me from generalizing to the test data. So regularization reduces the variance, but the main point is that it does not increase the bias. So although I'm reducing the overfitting part, I'm not going towards underfitting. I'm reducing overfitting, but I'm not underfitting either. Because if I increase the bias, then I'm underfitting. But that does not happen with regularization and that's the power of that. Um, so it, it, it all depends, like I told you before, on this value of lambda. So uh, I have to select the value of lambda very carefully in order to achieve this point. <laughs> so as the value of lambda rises, it reduces the value of the coefficients and thus reducing the variance. So that's what we have to do. So we, we can start with lambda, let's say 0.2, and we keep on increasing that up to let's say two or three or four or five, whatever. We have to try out the different values. You can, you can Google uh, the values that people normally use, but I guess that they will be within this range. And then obviously uh, we, we, we can add, 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 add each of these value, we, we can do a cross validation. Each value of lambda is basically going to give me a value of S, and the ideal value of lambda is, is the one which is going to give me the highest cross validation score. And although I will, not, I will not be computing S, but we just use the concept of S to understand the thing. Uh, so obviously this is what we want to see that we, will, we have to increase lambda, but we have to see that where we have to stop uh, without losing any important properties in the data. Because if we keep on increasing lambda to a large value, then, the purpose of regulation increases. So for example, I start lambda 0.2 and I, I keep lambda up to two and between here, I find some value of an ideal value of the cross relation score. But if I keep on increasing three, four, five, 50, 100, then uh, the purpose of regularization is not going to be there. So I have to find an ideal value somewhere between here uh, because after that, the cross relation scores are going to decrease. Okay, and that, that means that maybe I've started to underfit. So therefore the value of lambda should be carefully selected. So I hope that uh, these concepts are clear to you. And if you have any queries, you can ask me. This is another topic that we discussed. So some students had uh, some concerns that can we apply the concepts of regularization? That means L1 and L2 specifically uh, for classification algorithms. It's pretty easy in regression. So um, you, you know that in, in the case of multi-layer perceptron, uh, we do have a loss function. 
And in that loss function, we can include L1 or L2 regularization as we have seen for the case of regression, okay? Similarly, for logistic regression as well, we have that sigmoid function. And it's basically logistic regression is very close to linear regression, except that it's for classification. So therefore, uh, the same concept I can apply to logistic regression as well. So it is possible to do L1 or L2 regression for multilayer perceptron. It is possible to do that for logistic regression. And it is also possible to do that through SVM. But in the case of SVM, it is not done through L1 or L2, uh, although we, we can do that. but we can also have some other techniques. So you can you can look up these uh, links here uh, to understand. So in, in the case of SVM, I have some parameters, for example, the, the margin parameter or the theta parameter, uh, I don't remember exactly, but there are two parameters which help me regularize the SVM model. They might not be specifically L1 or L2. In this case, yeah, we might use L1, L2 exactly in that way as we have done for regression case. For the case of SVM and XGBoost, it's done in different ways. So regularization does not mean always L1 or L2. So it could mean uh, some other ways as well. Like I told you in SVM, uh, we have some, we'll study those parameters when we when I do the video for the SVM, okay? And similarly in XGBoost, I have things like, for example, you can say, um, so if I want to, uh, for the case of XGBoost, I'll give you the example of the decision trees. So for the case of K nearest neighbor, it is not possible to define a regularization a process. And, and there's this tag exchange. You can, you can look this up if you want, okay? In the case of decision trees, it's the same as for XGBoost because XGBoost is based on decision trees. So, uh, so what we can do is that we limit the depth of the tree, we prune the tree, we take multiple trees, we have stricter stopping, stopping criteria. All of these are in fact regularization factors. These are regularizing and the random forest, the same thing. And by splitting up uh, you know, over hundreds of trees, I am doing regularization, but it is not L1 or L2 regularization. That's what you need to understand. Okay? So, so it's, it's different in different ways. So KNN is probably not possible. In decision trees and uh, yeah, in, in decision trees and XGBoost and SVM, the process is different. It is exactly the same for logistic regression and multi-layer perceptron. So you can look up these to understand. So in the project also, you can take care of these things. Uh, you can modify the. So that's the end of that. And uh, uh, so here, what we have is uh, just trying to. Uh, I will upload these obviously on the on the website on the the drive that we have. So I took this example from the net, so it's pretty easy to understand. You can see that uh, we have these um, linear regression, ridge, and lasso functions already defined in this SK learn dot linear model uh, module, and obviously we have this train test bit, and this is the score that we're interested in. This is called the cross validation score, so it gives me the best uh, score for the testing performance, okay? So we can see that when I'm getting that best score. Uh, so we have this housing data here. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, the, the housing data. We have things like ID, date, the price of the house, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, square foot living, square foot lot, floors, waterfront, view, condition, grade, square foot, square foot, year built, year renovated, zip code, blah, 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 okay? So if you do wrangling, then you can do lots and lots of stuff, but that's not the purpose in this lab. So I just import it. Uh, so the shape is like I have 21,000 rows and I want all my variables obviously to be numerical, except this date variable, so I can just delete that. Uh, and as, if I print the missing values, so square feet above is, has two missing values. So what I do is that I simply, you know, delete Yes, I delete that, you know, because I can do away with two rows. It's not a problem. I also drop these columns. I can also drop more columns, like lat long or year build, because that just does, does not really make sense uh, putting a lat long, but you can let it go and see what happens. Okay. So currently, we are just deleting these two. Um, and then obviously, we just, uh, you know, draft this X and Y as we do normally with a 75 25 split. 
so we we already did that uh, oh i'm sorry for that so i just uh, so we did that so when i when i executed the linear regression model so i got almost 70% accuracy uh, and then i do a ridge regression so i have this array called cross validation scores with ridge regression and alpha is obviously um, the different values of lambda that i'm trying out so i try out 1 to 9 and uh, alpha I keep is i into 0.25. So I'm trying out nine values. Uh, and each time I multiply that by 0.25. So I start with 0.25, then two into 0.25, which is 0.5, et cetera, et cetera. And then in, uh, at the end, nine into 0.25. And obviously I fit the ridge model, uh, which is ridge regression. It's a completely different algorithm. I find out the cross validation score with a 10 fold cross validation. Uh, I multiply that score by 100. Uh, because this, if I, I have to multiply this by 100 as well, but I did not do that here. Uh, and then obviously I, I append both these values in the array and at the end, I just print both these things. So uh, so these are the different values and these are the cross validation scores. So you can see that the highest score that I'm getting is probably uh, with the value of two, 0 0.99. There's not much difference, but um, it's 69.9 and 69.93. And in this case, I'm getting 69.09, but it's avoiding the overfitting. Although the, uh, the score is not, is not that high as compared to the original one, but in this case, uh, when you do the ridge regression, then you are not overfitting. That's, the, that's, what, that's what is confirmed. And uh, so I choose this two, and then I make a prediction. Yeah, so in this case, this is the, sorry about that, this is the training data. So I'm, I'm using that on the training data. And then when you use the testing data, 69.932. So let me test with that. 93, it's almost the same, 69.932 with the alpha equals to two. And then I try out lasso. And lasso, if I can have uh, this lambda. So I just append that. So, uh, so I, I just don't know what's this variable. You can check this out. Okay. So in this case, the again, the best value that we obtain is through two. And I try, try out two and the test score is 69.934. Uh, so it's exactly the same as this one, which the original that we got. And then obviously I can, you know, uh, just print these three things. And uh, yeah, so linear 69, 0 0.699347, 0 0.699323445. So linear and lasso is almost the same. Okay. So that's it for me. From me, as far as regression is concerned, if you have some queries, please don't forget to ask me on the group on WhatsApp. And I'm going to give a small assignment about this as well. Okay. Uh, thanks for watching this video and uh, see you soon with another video.